The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Today's guest, Russell Ricks, experienced a remarkable encounter with the other side when he was just eight years old. That experience, along with a rare brain condition in the linkage between right and left sides of the brain, may have contributed to his lifelong career as a visual artist. His artwork has been collected throughout the United States, and a large body of his artwork was recently shown at the prestigious Springville Museum of Art as part of the Passages and Pathways exhibit. His monumental indoor murals grace the walls of some major corporations such as Cabela's, Novatech, and Alcoa. Russell served a proselytizing mission in the Sacramento, California, and Oakland, California missions from 1977 to 1979 for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and has served in various callings as a lay member of the LDS Church. He's the author of Remember, A Little Boy's Near-Death Experience. Russell, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you, Lee. Um, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's still morning, certainly in, in Utah. It's still morning here in Maine as well. Is Russell, right? your, your book describes how you were bullied in school, perhaps on account of an undiagnosed brain condition that impaired yeah. your early social skills. So tell us a little about that condition. Um. The condition is known as a genesis of the corpus callosum. And uh, your cerebral cortex consists of your left hemisphere and your right, right hemisphere. But together, it's called the cerebral cortex. And underneath the cerebral cortex, um, a normal brain, according to whatever is normal, um, ha- has this system called a corpus callosum. And its purpose is to create an information pathway. So um, there are a bundle of about 180 to 200 million nerve fibers, and it, it, it creates an information pathway from one side of the uh, brain to the other. So from your left to your right, your right to your left, whatever, whenever information comes in, and in order for it to be processed, if it's, if it's logical, but it enters the right side, which is more the creative, emotional, language side, um, then it has to have a pathway to enter the logical side, analytical side, whatever. And then with that quick pathway, you're able to make quick decisions. But with my disability, it's almost sometimes there's almost a like a split second delay. And mm. um, it's similar to a split brain person. And the split brain person, this is done in surgery uh, because they have. Uh, brain seizure, or sometimes it's caused by an accident. And so they surgically split the brain to yes. try to stop those seizures. And uh, it's not the same as a split brain individual, but it's similar too. Um, and with repetition, but much more than the average person, we I, I found that I can learn. Uh, so eventually, once I get it, I get it, and it stays with me. But mm-hmm. until I get it, you can tell me time after time after time after time, and, and uh, <laughs> it doesn't do any good until it just finally sinks in. So it's, uh, <laughs> but I've learned through, uh, I found out 10 years ago about this disability, and, and I did not know why I struggled socially and with communication, other than the fact I knew I had a hearing loss. I had that diagnosed. Um, mm-hmm. And t- up until that time, I didn't realize there was an additional issue. Right. Um, and 10 years ago, through an MRI scan, I found out about the genesis of the corpus callosum. And they say about yep. uh, one in every 1,800 to 2,000 people have this. And there are people walking around that have no idea uh, that have this. A- 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 and, as uh, you did for, for most yeah, of your life. Exactly. But, yeah. Exactly. Well, now, um, Russell, yeah. when you turned eight, you were baptized into the LDS church, but uh, according to your book, you feared the old patterns of being bullied in school, that that, that, that would uh, not go away. And then something really amazing happened to you. So um, tell us about that uh, near-death-like experience. 
Okay, I will. Uh, I just want to back up just a hair, and I know we only have 30 minutes, but uh, earlier in my life, what led me to um, this near-death experience is when a few days after my baptism, because maybe a few weeks after, um, I remember thinking about feelings that I felt during the baptism, the feelings of peace and tranquility, and I think that's the first time in my life when I identified God, um, where I felt something, where I really felt something. But earlier in my life, and it was before I could even form words, I believe, because uh, I remember trying to talk to my family about it. Um, I saw, when my mom had the most beautiful high soprano voice, and she would sing to us every day. This was part of our loving upbringing. Uh, it was a trained voice. Um, she sang with the USO when she was 15. She auditioned in Hollywood, was slated to go that direction. But when she found out that the family took second place in her career, she decided that that's not the direction she wanted to go. She used her talent um, singing uh, at funerals, singing to her family, singing at church. And so we were raised with my dad painting, my mom singing. But I had this memory that stayed with me all my life of my mom was singing to us, and people dressed in white would come into our home and surround her, and she would sing. And I tried to get the attention of my family at such a young age, and I think it was, I wasn't even one year old, so I couldn't really express myself, and it seemed like I was the only person that could see these people, but they would listen to us surround mom as she would sing, listen to a few songs, and then one by one they would leave. And this seemed to happen for, I guess, a few months. And then I didn't see them anymore. And the research today has shown that little children, zero to two years old, can form brief memories. And this memory, I didn't tell anyone until I told my wife two years ago, about a year and a half before, or two years ago, and then my, my mom died about a year and a half ago. And mm-hmm. then I shared it with my mom a few weeks after I shared it with my wife. Um, but I did share my out-of-body experience, which I'm going to describe. Um, <laughs> If you can hear that vehicle next door, my son's taking off and I'm sitting in my wife's car. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, can you hear that? <laughs> no, 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 you're you're okay. coming in cl- loud and clear. Okay, good. Um, so that memory that I had stayed with me, and and at eight years old, after my baptism, and, and thinking about those feelings that I felt, I remember thinking one night, well, hey. My slate's clean. I've been baptized. I've been washed clean. And so if that's true, if I could go to heaven now, it would be the perfect time for me to go. Mm-hmm. And see, my birthday's in July, and I started school late. I didn't go to kindergarten. I went to school at the age of seven. And so here I was, eight years old, and I was going to start second grade in a few weeks. And I thought, I can't go back to that. I won't go back to that. And I thought, well, if my slate's clean, and no one clean thing can enter the kingdom of heaven. And right, so right now would be the perfect time. And so because of that earlier experience that I had, I began forming an understanding um, that there was something far greater beyond this life. And I thought, well, if that's true, then there, there is a God. And if there is a God, he, he will answer my prayers because that's what he does. So I got on my knees. And I said, Heavenly Father, the way I see it, my state's clean. And now would be the perfect time to go. And I cannot face another day outside. See, my home I grew up in was, was a loving home. Um, you know, there were the typical sibling rivalry, rivalries and stuff. But well, for the most part, it was a loving home. But life outside that home taught me that it was cruel and abusive. And my I was determined that if, if I had to, I would just stay in bed, you know, and not go out into the world so I could keep my slate clean and and not have it tarnished by the world. But So I got on my knees and I said, Heavenly Father, I can't take another day of this. And, and either somehow you've got to take this away or you take me away. And then I climbed in bed and cried myself to sleep. And I'll, I don't describe it in the book because I wasn't sure if I found the words for it. wasn't sure... Really, what I believe happened is, is I felt myself drifting into a deep sleep. 
uh, it was kind of like blacking out for a moment, and then it was like the the bed started to spin, you know, like the room would spin when you're getting dizzy. And then it it felt like it was I was being pulled down, like I was dropping like a lead weight. But at the same time, I felt this pull, some force was pulling me upward. And the next thing I knew, I was floating on my back in darkness, and above me was this distant, bright, loving light. Mm. And I felt that love immediately, and I craved it, and I wanted to go there. And at first I thought, wow, this is, this is me. Here I am, and yet I'm down there too in bed. How, how can I be here? And I thought at first, well, this is, this is a, this has to be a dream. Because how, how is that possible to be split in half, and here I am alive? And then as I was drawn into that light, once I was surrounded by that light, I found myself standing high on the mountaintop in this beautiful aspen grove. And I was in one inside, one end of, edge of the clearing, and the clearing was probably 25, 30 feet in radius with aspens all around me. And there was other forest plant life as well, like a typical forest. So it was familiar in that sense, but yet... The light was different. It was like everything was alive. Light was coming from within. Every object, the tree, the flowers, the um, plant life, um, and it was vibrant. And I saw colors that I did not, that I have never seen here. And being an artist by profession, that intrigued me. And I I had started painting when I was eight years old. I don't know if it. it was, so I don't know if this experience invited me to do that, and I wanted to discover that might that might be what inspired it. But my father was a full-time artist, and so I grew up with it. I just knew by the time I was eight years old that's what I wanted to do. And I've since found that really to try to paint that expression of what I saw, what I felt, it's impossible because we simply do not have the pigment here. And... Uh, to create those colors in our prison of light is not as full as it is in heaven. It, it seems that everything on the other side of the bell is expanded. And so once I was in that space, then I realized, my prayer's answered. I'm here. Mm-hmm. And I, I felt something different. It felt familiar, like high on a mountaintop when we'd go out painting. Uh, at that time, before I turned eight, I wasn't really painting, but I would go with my dad as he would paint. So these were familiar in places that I loved. But yet, everything was expanded. It was far greater. And I had this sense that I was in an, an, a different realm, a spiritual realm. And that where and that, I was was some sacred space. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and then you had a visitor. Yes. But as, Tell us about that. And I will. And as I uh, as I was, oh gosh, we got 15 minutes left. As I was uh, looking around, I, I mentioned that everything was expanded. I felt I, I felt connected with everything. I felt this oneness, and I, I everything seemed to have its own vibration of energy. Uh, and each each object, each flower, plant, blade of grass, tree, leaf on the tree. And the birds singing and everything, they seem to be expressing joy, uh, praising God. And, and this was continuous and never ending. And uh, so each object sent out its own vibration, and that vibration was similar to music. And, and they were swaying in the rhythm of that. And I was intrigued by all that, and I wanted to explore. And I noticed in the middle of this clearing was this, uh, narrow beaten down pathway that went through the clearing uh, the, what was behind me went to some higher holier sphere I said perhaps it was God's kingdom and then what was ahead of me was the thicket of the forest beyond I wasn't sure and, and I thought well this is such a neat experience and I had the sense at that time by the way that I knew that I would be returning that, uh, and yet I felt the separation from my body but I had this sense that I was still connected to it in the sense that I, that I was not assigned to death, that this was only temporary and I would have to go back. I didn't, I, I sensed that, but I tried to ignore it, and all I wanted to do was explore and, and experience as much as I could before 
I returned because for the first time in my life, I just felt absolutely pure, indescribable love. And it was what I needed. Yes. So I walked down this path to the other side, and I was going to go beyond to, to explore what else was out there. And I came to the edge of the inside of the other side of the clearing. There was a stone on my left hand about adult waist high and a tighter group cluster of Aspen behind it. And right at that point, I was just about to step beyond the stone, and I just came to an abrupt stop. I had this strong sense that beyond that was the point of no return, and I would have no choice but to go back to Earth. But I was not ready to go. I didn't want to. I would have stayed in that space for eternity if I could. So I knelt against that stone and just began to sob, put my hands in my face and leaned against the stone. And Moments later, I felt this touch on my right shoulder. And a voice that said, Russell, what's the matter? What's wrong? Why are you crying? What's wrong? And I turned and I saw this being, this personage with white hair and a white beard and a long white robe down to his ankle and the sleeves of his robe came down to his wrist. And as an eight-year-old, my description at that time in my mind was his eyes appear to be on fire, and yet they're not. And I later found that description both in LDS scripture and in the Bible. A couple times in Revelation, it, 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 it describes this being as having eyes with the flame of fire and hair, of, hair as white as the driven snow and so on. Mm. So, but at that time, I was not aware of that description. <laughs> so that was my observation of this being, and there was this love that emanated from him that it, is, it expanded even more so from him directly, the giver of that love, the personification, personification of that love, it expanded even more than when just, than just before he appeared to me in that uh, garden space. And I sensed immediately who that was, and then he reached down to pick me up. And here's what's interesting. I also saw myself pictured as a boy of maybe four or five years old, too. So he reached down to pick up this little child. And I, I had that sense when I saw myself as this younger child than I was at eight at that time. It was symbolic of being, uh, of, of my life before I was born. It symbolized my pre birth life. And it was almost like I was at present, having this experience of present and feeling that love that I needed at present, but also re-experiencing a moment with Christ before I was born into mortality. He reached down to pick me up, and as he did so, his arms stretched out, and his feet pulled up, and I could see the wounds in his wrists, his palms, and then I also noticed wounds in his feet. As I looked down, and he, as he bent over, his robe fell open a little, and I could see a wound in his side, and that just clarified who I already sensed by the Spirit, who that was. <laughs> Yes. And he picked me up and took me in his arms. <laughs> and in a pillar of light, we lifted off the ground. And in the distance, in the atmosphere high above, there was this city of light. And in this, in this experience, by the way, during the experience, I had this downpouring of knowledge come into my mind through the whole experience, and it was continuous. It never ceased, and it was like I was gaining all this knowledge of how the universe was made. It was like, hey, I'm smarter than, uh, who's that scientist who just passed away, Steve Haw Hawking? Steve, yeah, Hawking, yeah. Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I knew more than him, I knew more than all the scientists on the Earth, and I was thinking, I'm only eight years old, and I understand this, and it's simple, I can understand it. And yet, after the experience, that the knowledge that I had gained, it was like a veil was just blocked right in front of it, and I couldn't mm. remember the details that I had learned, but I remember having this increase of knowledge that was, you know, everything, all my senses were expanded. Well, wow. and and there was no sense of time during, I, it, I couldn't tell you if it was days or if it was weeks, but it seemed like it was more than just a few moments or a few hours. And, but we traveled for, for, some time in the speed of light, when we arrived to the city of light, uh, <laughs> there, um, so 
from my experience, what, I, what I've read, just my experience, is God gives experiences to everyone. It doesn't matter what religion they came from or no religion. He understands us so perfectly and so intimately. He knows what's meaningful to us. He knows what we're passionate about. He knows our spirit. He understands our spiritual perspective. He knows what we're, what our talents are. After all, he gave us our gifts and talents and so on. He knows us better than anyone. And so, like a parent, in order for them to communicate with their infant child, they have to, you know, get down to their level. I believe that God does that with each one of us individually, regardless of where we came from. He takes mm-hmm. us on our level and gives us an experience. And uh, even an experience that causes us maybe to stretch a little bit. But he gives us something that's not beyond what we can begin to understand. Because he wants, he knows our divine potential. He knows who we are as spirit. He knows what we can become. And he wants us to reach that. So rather than giving us something that's way, way, way over our head, he starts with something that's a little closer to where we would understand. So regardless of where we came from, I believe that those who sincerely seek him and desire to follow him, all those paths will eventually merge into one, which leads to God's kingdom. And what did he, so what he, did he tell you, okay. um, Russell, Go during ahead. the, during, uh, the, as you came toward the city, what, uh, what did he have to say about it? Okay. So what I was leading up to was my experience was very Mormon, you know, because I was, that was my upbringing. And as I drew close to the city, there were, I noticed, it seems that all the buildings appeared as gold. Um, and there was this incredible light emanating from it, beyond description. And the, the wall around the city appeared as gold. The streets were paved in gold. But there were two buildings that looked very familiar to me. One looked like um, an architectural replica of a Salt Lake Temple on the gold. One looked like the, the Pioneer Tabernacle adjacent to it. And this was a very familiar and personal icon to me because was our, our family would travel to Utah and we would often stop at Temple Square. So this became very personal. And the Lord was giving me a very personal experience, which I don't have time to talk about today, but in my book it describes some things that happened since my experience where the Lord pointed directly back to that experience I had as an eight-year-old child to let me know that he was right there. Anyway. Yes, incl- including that mural in, in inside the temple that <laughs> was uh, yeah. the, your vision, basically. I wish oh. we could talk about that today, but I, we, we're not going to be able to. So. No, there's not there's not time, but um, I would encourage people to uh, to get your book. Anyway, go ahead with uh, what you were saying. Okay, thank you. So he brought me into this building that was like a tabernacle, and we found ourselves alone, and he sat me down on a, on a bench near the front, and he... Put his arm around me again and says, okay, Russell, let's talk about it. What's going on? What's wrong? And, I mean, just very easy to talk to and very loving. And there was no fear on my part. I knew com- that I could completely trust him. And, by the way, as we would converse with each other, it was it was through our thoughts. Um, mm-hmm. And when I read these near-death experiences, it was like, hey, I know this. You know, you know, and, and when I read, like, uh, Raymond Moody's book and those that followed afterwards, it was familiar. Anyway, he, he said, well, what's wrong, Russell? And I said, well, I'm afraid. He said, well, what are you afraid of? Well, I know I have to go back, but why can't I stay here? This is my home, and I feel loved here. I'm safe. Mm. Why do I have to go back to that ugly experience? And the Savior said, Russell... Because of who you are, because of what you've done here before you were born, because of what, you know, it was like I was experiencing the moment before I was born. Because of what you've done here, you're very special, and I have some blessings for you. And my assignment, he was describing it as if I was about to embark on mortality for the first time. He says, you'll be born into a a good family, um, a good parent, and you will be taught about my truth. You will be taught about me and about Heavenly Father, and you will have a strong belief in me and about Heavenly Father, and you will have a belief in prophets both old and modern day, and LDS, and we do believe that we are led by modern prophets. And 
and he said, and he he said, you will have the spirit with you, and this will be a guide to help you get back. So it will warn you when things, when when you're about to do something that you shouldn't, um, or warn you of danger and so on, which it has. And uh, he described several gifts and tools that I would be given to help me through this life. He said, so you're not alone. And he said, and remember, everyone's going to make mistakes. And that's why it was necessary for me to perform the atonement. And I willingly did that because I love you, and I love all of your brothers and sisters. And so I did that for you. So you don't need to worry. All you need to do is follow me as the scriptures outline, obey my commandments, and be a good boy. And everything will be fine. Just just do that, and you'll you'll be fine. And so he said, Russell, it's time to go. Are you ready? And I took confidence in what the Savior told me, specific, especially since he had performed the atonement. Mm. And I said, yes, I'm ready. But, of course, there was still that anxiety there. But I took faith in him, trust in him, and we left the city in the same manner in which we came. And he said, but, oh, but before you go, I want to make one last promise. I promise you throughout your life, I will send messages of my love in a way that you will know that they are directly from me and let you know that I love you. And so the experiences that I had since that time, which some I share in my book, and you mentioned one, the experience in the LDS Temple where the artist had painted my experience on the wall in the mm. luster of the temple representing what perhaps the spiritual world would be like when we get to the other side. There were details in that mural that were in my experience, and it was beyond question. It was beyond coincidence. And not only this, I've had several of these experiences, types of experiences that related back to that moment. So the Lord, what it, what it tells me, and what the message that I want to get out to everyone is, when God makes a promise to us, whether it's his atonement or whatever it is, and, whether, and even if it's a very personal promise to make some prayer, no matter how hard life gets, put your faith and trust in that. He will fulfill his promises. He will not go back on them. That is my message. He loves you. He knows you. And no matter how crappy your life might be right now, there is hope. And that hope is in him. And so that's really the message of my book. Yes. Uh, well, Russell, uh, Two minutes left. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> uh, I was going to say uh, it, it's a uh, it's it's a lovely picture the the book paints uh, of your life and and you uh, you mentioned there are several experiences there were some uh, uh, near miss auto accidents and things that happened uh, along the way that uh, reminded you that Jesus was with you uh, during those times. Uh, so why not tell our audience where uh, where they might see your art, for one thing, and where they can get a copy of your book? Okay. My art can be found on my website, russellrickart.com. That's R-U-S-S-E-L-L-R-I-C-K-S. Um, and um, or uh, I just recently uh, got into the Seagull 3 Gallery. I don't know if they have anything... Uh, up on the website, but this is in Salt Lake City, and I'm also in an online gallery at Xanadu Art Gallery on their online uh, gallery, and this Xanadu Gallery, are uh, they are in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. And I'm just, re- I have stepped out of the art business for a while, but I'm just getting back into it, and uh, so I'm rebuilding galleries. Now, my book can be found at RussellRicksBooks.com. Just click on one of the icons there. You can either order a uh, ebook or a softbound copy through Amazon, Barnes and Noble, or Books and Things. Um, so you'll find the icons there, and you'll also find videos on my on the media page of my website that give further details of my Ter- Terrific. So, and the title of the book is "Remember: A Little Boy's Near Death Experience." Well, thank yeah. you, Russell. Thanks for sharing your story with us today. Thank you. Um, it's uh, it's it's an amazing story, and um, 
uh, I would encourage people to get your book. If you would like to hear this program again, folks, or, or any of our more than 230 programs to date, just go to our website at nderadio.org. And for more information about IANS, please go to their website at IANDS, IANDS dot org. And be with us again next week, 11 a.m. Eastern for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening. <laughs>